Uh, okay, so in the last section, we talked about uh, static stability, the idea that um, some objects, when they're at rest, can be in a uh, stable equilibrium uh, position, so that if we tried to move them or nudge them a little bit, that object would experience restoring forces that bring it back to that equilibrium uh, state. Um, and we understood that by thinking about adding up all of the potential energies that uh, an object um, possesses, and if any, you know, nudges and perturbations we make on an object would increase that potential energy. If everything we do increases it, then it will always experience restoring forces as it rolls back kind of down the hill of that potential energy uh, landscape, if you will. Um, so how does that help us understand, though, how bicycles stay upright, right? We talked about this potential energy um, framework giving us a kind of heuristic that told us that, um, you know, if we imagine thinking about the base of support of an object, um, then if a vertical line goes through the interior of the polygon forming the base of support, that would mean that if we tried to rotate the object or move it around, um, it would experience a restoring force due to gravity. Uh, how does that help us with bicycles, though, right? Bicycles, uh, there's no way I know how to draw this. Uh, you've got a back wheel and a frame, and then maybe some kind of like fork thing. Um, this is where you sit, you know, there's some pedals, there's like a gear, there's a chain going to the back ring, and then there's a and there's a front wheel sitting over here with some handlebars, great handlebars. There we go. We got a bicycle. How does the idea of static stability help us understand why a bicycle is able to stay upright? Actually, you might say, um, it seems like bicycles stay upright in spite of what we just talked about. If I think about the base of support of this bicycle, so if this is like a side view, um, then looking at it from above, uh, the base of support, the wheels just touch in two points. The base of support is just a line. There's not even a polygon for the vertical line going through the bike's center of mass we talked about to even go through the interior of any polygon. Um, you know, at best, maybe you very precariously position the center of mass of you and the bike directly above this line connecting the wheels. But even then, it will be at best in a state of unstable static equilibrium, right? As I'm sure you can imagine, if you, you know, balance precariously on a bike, but you don't move, um, you will just very quickly fall over to one side or the other. Despite this, moving bicycles manage to be very stable. Um, how, how is that? You know, why is that? And in fact, it's not just bicycles. Um, the same thing is true of just like a moving coin. So um, let's see if I kind of move my camera and prop it up on this pen. So I think you should be able to see this coin. And I'm sure you know if I do this experiment where I try to balance it and then I let go, if I balance it right on the edge, that's uh, great. But if I just give it a tiny touch, it falls over. And usually, um, I don't even do a great job of balancing it on its side in the first place. Okay. So the coin, when it's balanced on the edge, is very statically unstable, right? It's ready to fall over um, in response to the slightest little perturbation. And yet, a rolling coin will uh, happily balance on its edge as long as it keeps up some particular speed, right? So if I just kind of let that coin roll, um, it happily rolls across my writing surface and off the table. So what physical principles govern this kind of dynamic stability? It's clear that both the coin and the bicycle are not statically stable, but somehow when they're in motion, um, when they're in motion, something seems to help stabilize and keep it upright. So what is going on? Uh, there's a few different things, actually, that we have to consider when we want to understand this. Um, so dynamic stabilization. Let's first talk about coins. So it turns out the coin rolling, just a single wheel rolling, has a certain amount of dynamic stability. And a bicycle uses both the mechanism I'm going to talk about for coins and something else. Um, and so we'll see, we'll see what that something else is in just a moment. So the first thing is that a coin, well, let's say a rolling coin, a rolling coin has angular momentum. A rolling coin has angular momentum. Um, and that means that there's a sense in which the coin wants to continue spinning at the same angular speed about the same axis. Uh, um, and it will do so unless it is acted on by torques. Right? So uh, let's suppose I have a coin kind of rolling this way. So its angular velocity is in that direction. Um, and the right-hand rule tells us the direction the angular momentum uh, is pointing, right? So on the one hand, the coin does have some tendency to resist uh, changes to, um, to its angular momentum. And 
rotating the axis about which the coin is rolling is something that changes the um, is something that changes the angular momentum because the momentum is a vector quantity. Um, but that on its own is not actually enough to keep the, the wheel or the coin uh, upright. Uh, however, the existing angular momentum of the wheel or the coin turns out to create a kind of self-steering effect um, by something that's known as gyroscopic precession. Gyroscopic precession. Um, and this happens whenever an object experiences a torque which is perpendicular uh, to its angular momentum. So when you have, uh, say, a coin that's perfectly upright, um, the support force acting on the coin, let me draw like the coin edge on, so it's rotating like into the page. Um, as the coin rolls, the support force, the support force is acting straight up, right? And the coin's center of mass is right in the middle of the coin. Okay, so when the coin is you know rolling straight up and down on its edge, um, the support force uh, is keeping the coin you know on the table or on the ground, and the support force is pointing directly towards the center of mass. I'm emphasizing that because remember, a torque is the lever arm crossed with the force, and if the lever arm is pointing directly towards the force, um, there will be no torque. Right, that's the same as if you know, I have a seesaw, and instead of pushing up or down on it, I try to like push in or out. You know, that exerts no torque about this pivot because the force is aligned with the lever arm. Same thing for a perfectly upright uh, coin. Okay. On the other hand, if the coin starts to lean a little bit in one direction, if the coin starts to lean a little bit in one direction, you know, the support force is still pointing straight up uh, over here, but now the center of mass you know has moved and so the support force and the lever arm are no longer perfectly aligned okay so this ends up exerting a torque on this coin um, and that torque will be perpendicular to the axis about which the coin uh, is rotating the axis about which the coin is rotating so because of that the coin starts to steer it starts to turn right so the coin leans but then it also uh, turns because of this torque okay and that kind of turning uh, is uh, it's called precessing in this case. So this way uh, that the coin or the wheel, a single wheel behaves, where as it rolls uh, in some direction, if it starts to lean, the torque acting on it will turn it in the same direction that it's leaning, is a form of dynamic stabilization. Right? Um, and what's happening is as long as the coin is like rolling fast enough, when it starts to lean, it'll start to turn in that direction. and the coin's velocity will take it so that the bottom of the coin kind of gets itself back underneath the center of mass of the coin. So by turning in the direction that you're falling, as long as you move forward fast enough, you bring yourself back over the center of mass. So the coin kind of brings itself back over its own center of mass. Um, and that explains why the coin can stay upright as it rolls along. It also explains why the coin eventually falls over. Friction is kind of sapping it of some of its kinetic energy. And when it slows down to the point where this kind of dynamic stabilization doesn't kick in, when it no longer brings itself underneath its own center of mass as it leans one way or the other, uh, eventually the coin falls over. Right. So uh, this phenomena, gyroscopic precession, explains why if I roll a coin, or if I just have a single wheel and I send it moving, um, it will stay upright for a certain amount of time. Um, that's good enough for coins. It turns out that uh, that dynamic stabilization of bikes, bikes have an extra trick up their sleeve. Stabilization for bicycles. Bikes have an extra trick up their sleeves. Uh, and the trick is that they've been shaped very cleverly. So uh, if the wheels of a bicycle are spinning and the bicycle, the whole bicycle starts to lean in one direction, because of the way the front wheel is designed and where the front wheel is positioned and also how the masses of these handlebars are distributed, um, as the bike leans, the handlebars will also turn. It, the, the wheel's potential energy can be reduced by rotating the handlebars, again, steering in the direction that the bike is leaning. Okay? So the wheels are falling because due to the shape of the bike, the wheel, the front wheel can lower its gravitational potential energy if it turns in the direction the bike is starting to fall over. So once again, you have 
um, uh, bicycles having an additional, an additional um, effect of the front wheel. The front wheel naturally turning into the direction the bicycle leans as it moves forward. Okay. So once again, you have another form of steering in the direction of your lean. And so you lean, you're starting to fall over, but then you turn in that direction and you, by moving forward fast enough, bring the center of mass back um, above uh, the base of support, that single line. Okay. Um, so, so that's great. That forms the essence of why bicycles can be dynamically stable, even though they're not statically stable. They have two natural forms of kind of self-stabilization by which they turn into the direction of their lean, which brings their center of mass back above the uh, base of support, even though the base of support is just a line. Okay. While we're talking about bicycles, we might as well talk about, like, why do we lean into turns? Uh, this is true if you're like making a turn on a bicycle, but not only bicycles, right? If you're riding a motorcycle, you do this. If you're skiing down a mountain and you take a turn, you do this. If you're water skiing, I mean, even if you're just running around a very tight edge, a very tight turn, um, you'll lean into that turn. And why do we do this? Actually, it's another form of, um, in a way, dynamic stabilization. What's going on? Suppose I have... Um, Suppose I have a person on, uh, let's make it a car. So I've got this car up on wheels. You already know that I can't draw, so you'll forgive me when I don't know how to make this three-dimensional. The car is going that way at first, okay? Uh, and what I want to do is say, you know, what happens if this car tries to take a turn? So the car's velocity wants to follow this direction. It wants to, you know, it's going straight and it's going to take a turn. Okay. Well, we know that that means that there needs to be um, a centripetal force, right? The car needs to accelerate to the left in order to make this turn. There has to be forces acting in order, um, in order to have such an acceleration. If we observe an acceleration, there must be forces. And for the car, the thing that can supply the sideways acceleration is in fact the force of friction, right? So in this case, the car wants to turn left. And the way the tires grip the road mean that there's going to be a frictional force um, acting, to the, acting to the left as the car goes through a turn. Okay. <clears throat> so this frictional force acts you know, uh, on the car's wheels. And the car's center of mass is you know, in the middle of the car, more or less. Um, and what you'll notice about this situation is that um, there's a force, but it's acting uh, in a direction which does not point towards the center of mass uh, of the car. And that means there's going to be a torque, right? So if we do our right-hand rule of um, pointing our finger in the direction of the force and pointing our middle finger in the direction of the center of mass, um, we see that there's uh, a torque that has some component that's going to want to flip the car over sideways, flip the car over like that. Uh, a torque, a torque wants to do this. Right. And if there's enough torque, cars will in fact flip over if you take a turn too fast. And in the lecture notes, there's a link to a YouTube video uh, demonstrating exactly that. Right. So this is, you know, for a statically stable object. You know, the car has a base of support, which is a nice big polygon. Um, and normally, when it's just you know sitting on flat ground, moving in a straight line, you know, we've got no problems. The thing is statically stable, and so if the car rotates a little bit, there's a restoring force. Um, but because the car can't lean into turns, if you take a turn too quickly, actually you'll flip the car over. Let's see this from the perspective of like a dynamically stable but a statically unstable object. So now I'm going to imagine looking at a bicyclist. So you know, there's no way I can draw this. There's just like a person sitting on a bike, and the bike is going into the whiteboard or into the screen as I'm looking at this. Um, and so if you're moving straight and you're pointed straight up and down, uh, you know, this bike is on solid ground, there's a support force, 
uh, at the contact between the ground and the tires, right? It's what's keeping the bike from sinking into the earth. And that support force is pointing straight up, right? Um, and it's pointing straight up towards the center of gravity of the person. There's no, there's no torques here, okay? Or at least if I looked at this, you know, sideways on, you might say uh, there's a support force over here, there's a support force on the front wheel. You know, actually both of these exert some torques forwards and backwards because neither of them are pointing towards the center of mass of, uh, of the whole bicycle. Uh, but they provide counterbalancing torques, and so the bicycle doesn't rotate forward and backwards. Okay. What I mean here is that, they're, in this case, they're not providing torques, uh, in this case, like to the left or the right of the way I've drawn this illustration. Okay. Well, now let's think about what happens when this bicyclist leans into a turn. Okay. So there's a cyclist, there's whatever. A uh, fantastic drawing. I spent more time on this in the lecture notes than I am right now. Um, so what I'm saying is that this person is taking a turn this way. So there is an acceleration. You know, if this person is going into the board, there's an acceleration here pointing to the right. Okay, and that's uh, an acceleration corresponding to some centripetal force, which is having this cyclist go through a turn. Right. So what's the situation here? Once again. Uh, the support force is just acting straight up and down, right? Uh, just as it was over here. Support force on each of the wheels. Um, just like with the car, the thing providing the centripetal force is the force of friction, right? It's also why if you have completely bald tires, you're just gonna fall if you try to take a turn because there's not enough friction to, uh, to support you. Okay, so with the help of this kind of diagram, we can start to understand why we lean into turns, right? What we're doing is uh, the force of friction, that's just however strong it needs to be in order to supply the centripetal force to give us an acceleration corresponding to however tight we're trying to take this turn. So for a fixed turning radius, um, the amount of frictional force acting here, you know, that's set by how fast you want to take that turn, okay? Similarly, uh, the support force here, uh, that's set by what your weight is. You know, how much force does gravity need to exert, or does the ground need to exert, so that the force of gravity doesn't push the bicycle into the earth. Right? So we have some total force, the sum of the support force and this, uh, this frictional force. And, you know, if we stay upright and try to take a turn, once again, we'll be experiencing a torque. Uh, and this will try this torque will act to make us flip over this way, um, flip over this way, and we would fall down. By leaning into the turn at just the right angle, you know, the total force, the sum of this vector and this vector is pointing in some direction. And if we lean so that that direction matches, you know, a direction that would point towards the center of mass of the combined bicycle and cyclist, um, then we won't experience that destabilizing torque. As long as we keep that lean throughout the turn, um, there are no torques acting on us, and so we go through that turn um, nice and smoothly, right? And this is the same principle that acts not just if you're on a bicycle, but again, if you're an elite Olympic skier going uh, through like a slalom course, or if you're just running through a tight turn, uh, anything like that. Okay. Great. Great. So that's kind of a fun explanation of, uh, you know, a phenomena I'm sure we've all thought about uh, as we experience the world, right? When we turn through things, we want to lean into them kind of intuitively. And the reason we lean into them is so that when we lean at the right angle, we don't experience any forces that make us want to lean more or less as we continue going through the turn. Okay. Uh, it wouldn't be a complete discussion of bicycles if I didn't briefly mention, you know, the idea of bicycle gears. Um, so, you know, the idea here in some ways is kind of simple. You know, the pedals of a bicycle are connected to a gear, uh, and the rear wheel of the bicycle is actually driven by... There's another set of gears here. This is called the cassette. This is called the cassette, and this is called the crank set. Uh, there's another set of gears here, and there's a chain that goes from the gear connected to our pedal to the gear around the, bike, uh, around the bike's rear wheel. Right? So bicycles have kind of a free-spinning front wheel uh, and a driven rear, rear wheel. Okay? 
Now, when bicycles were first invented, this is not how bikes worked. Uh, when bikes were first invented, maybe you've seen illustrations of those kind of very comical, uh, they were called penny farthings, where there was just like a direct drive of a front wheel, uh, and you sat way up here. This was, you know, big. Uh, and it was connected to a small wheel, which was passive. So the front wheel was driven, the rear wheel just followed along. Um, and this rear wheel was just a little bit of balance. Otherwise, this is kind of like a huge unicycle. Um, and so, you know, for original bicycles back in the 1870s uh, and 80s, I think, these were called penny farthings for some reason. Um, this is how bicycles were originally uh, designed. And as long as you were on flat ground, this system actually works totally fine. I mean, maybe you get a little bit nervous about falling off of your bicycle or getting onto your bicycle in the first place because it's a lot farther to the ground than on a modern bicycle. Um, but as long as you're on flat ground, this is actually kind of fine. Uh, you know, you turn these pedals uh, directly, that directly moves this big wheel. The amount of force you can exert, the amount of torques that that gets communicated into on these pedals cranking the axle that this wheel is connected to, um, you know, that's all kind of consistent with what humans are good at producing on flat ground. Uh, if you want to go uphill, I guess you're out of luck because, you know, the amount of force you're going to need to push on these pedals with becomes enormous. And if you try to go downhill, you're going to have to spin those wheels, uh, spin those pedals incredibly quickly, right? So, you know, it turns out to be kind of like a quirk of human physiology that as people, we're pretty good at outputting kind of certain levels of power under various conditions, right? So when it comes to, you know, how good are we at applying forces when we move our feet in a circle, it turns out that we output maximal power by sticking within actually a relatively narrow range of cadences, you know, how quickly we're rotating the pedals around, it's called the cadence. Um, you know, we're good at doing maximum power output in a narrow range of like medium fast cadences, exerting medium hard forces on the pedals in order to do so. So over long distances, this is much more human power efficient than spinning much, much faster, um, but with less force, or spinning slower, but with a lot more force, right? So penny farthings were kind of optimized the kind of size of how much, how big is this front wheel? Every time you rotate these pedals around, the whole front wheel would spin around once. And so like the circumference of the big wheel uh, is how far you would go with each revolution of the pedals. So in a sense, the way they chose how big to make this front wheel um, was basically by optimizing for, let's say, human power conditions, conditions on flat ground, on flat ground. OK, well, what if you don't want to go on flat ground all the time? Um, or what if your capacity for human power output is slightly different than your friends, something like that? That's where modern bicycles come in. Um, by having this kind of indirect series of gears where now, you know, turning the pedals one revolution corresponds to turning the gear on the crankset one revolution. One revolution on the crankset can correspond to different numbers of revolutions of the rear wheel, right? If this cassette gear is, you know, really small compared to the crankset or really big compared to the crankset, then one revolution of the pedals will correspond to many revolutions of the rear wheel or just a few. And so modern bikes have this kind of indirect drive system. You can constantly shift gears so that you're always keeping the same cadence at like a medium hard force level um, and having that correspond to different levels of forward motion of your bike. Right. And so this is kind of like choosing your level of mechanical advantage. And so as you go up and down hills, across flat terrain, across rough or bumpy terrain, you can try to stay in kind of the sweet spot of human physiology, um, exerting this like medium hard force with a medium fast cadence. Okay, so that was just kind of an interesting aside since we're in the business of explaining how objects work and we we're already talking about bicycles. Um, in section one, we kind of covered these ideas of static stability as ultimately coming from, if you like, going downhill on total potential energy landscapes. Um, and then we talked about dynamic stability, the idea that if you can figure out a system that has some sort of self-steering capacity, so that if it starts to fall over, maybe it's statically unstable, but if it starts to fall over, if it steers in that direction and it's moving fast enough, it will like dynamically stabilize itself. All right, so in the next section, um, we're going to change gears uh, and think about like planets and satellites and rocket ships 
orbiting the world, blasting into outer space, uh, this kind of thing.